Okay, uh, let's we'll start now. Uh, I wasn't planning this, but I realized that in in some ways or in some capacity, tonight is a uh, hespid or a eulogy. I realized that as much as there are people on this call who knew my mom and who spent time in our home, uh, lots of family and friends. I realize that there are many people here who never had a chance to meet my mom, which is kind of hard for me to fathom uh, as we were really close and she genuinely loved to get to know the people in my life. She always like made made a point of meeting our friends, meeting the people who we went to school with, who were our teachers, anybody in our life she wanted to get to know, or it just happened by itself. We brought people to our house all the time. And so it's weird for me that there's so many people on this call who, who never met her. Uh, it's still, it feels almost impossible to me. And the truth is, even though she greatly discouraged me from becoming a shul rabbi, uh, I think she would have liked you all, your uh, genuine earnestness and your passion and your friendliness, and that you actually care about your rabbis. That's a big difference. That would have been the saving grace. I don't know if she could have imagined that I would have had the opportunity to serve a shul and a community such as this one. I, um, I wish I could have come here tonight and taught you about my mom's Torah. I wish I could give a sheer on the topic of emet, of honesty and integrity, which she so deeply embodied, perhaps to a fault. Or on v'yahavta at Hashem Elokecha, a lecture about love, how she modeled and expressed unconditional love freely. Or to teach you about the ins and outs of hachnasat orchim, welcoming guests which would really be about how to go beyond the basics because the truth is people never felt like guests in our home. If you were there with my mom and my dad, you were treated like family, pajamas were encouraged. Or as I shared in her, I shared earlier this week on her yurt site, I never understood the novelty of the Midrash's claim that Avram had his tent open on all four sides. Our front door was literally always open as was our back door and people came into our house at any point in the day, announced or unannounced. I wish I could give a class about Torah Habayit, the Torah of the home, how to have a home that is safe and secure, or a class about Machloket and tell you about all the yelling matches we had about things which were important and unimportant, but which were moments of love and connection. Or I wish I could give you a sheer about laughter and persistence and presence in the face of one's own mortality. But I can't do any of those things, not yet. I still feel like my pain and my grief are too great. They're too overwhelming to move past too difficult to set aside and to share about her. The grief and the continued mourning are so present that I cannot ignore it, not yet. So instead I come here tonight to teach and share about grief, suffering and pain, about my own reflections on these topics as refracted through a small slice of Torah and through our tradition, its teachings and musings on these matters. In doing so, in this learning and in sharing process, I'm hoping, I'm praying that I can get to the other side, but more on that soon. The truth is just gathering with all of you here tonight, friends, new and old, family, new and old, 
is an incredibly comforting gift. I wanted to share, I'm gonna share my screen a few times for some Torah, but just send a chat if I leave it open too long. This is a picture of me and my mom and Ronen when he was born. Um, just so some of you could have a picture, all of you, including myself. So there's a Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah where Yitzchak says on the Pasuk that Yitzchak says, I don't know when I'm going to die. And the Midrash shares seven things that are hidden from humanity. I only gave the first two. I'll, let, I'll share you the other five later. Um, not tonight, a different time. And the first two that the Midrash lists of things that are hidden from humanity are Yom Hamita and Yom Hanechama. That there are things people want to know. Who doesn't want to know when they're going to die? Who wouldn't want to know what is the date? I could then plan accordingly. I know how much time I have left on this planet. I know how much time I have to spend with people. I can budget properly. I can not put off the things that I really wanted. I can figure out, oh, I could spend a few years here, a few years there. Who wouldn't want to know the time that they're going to die? And yet the Midrash says, this is, this is hidden from us. This is hidden from humanity. And similarly, the Yom Nechama. And the proof text for Yom Nechama is actually a pasu from Yeshaya. And it's about um, the end of days. The, when is the ultimate comfort going to come? When is Mashiach going to come? When is there going to be peace on this planet? Uh, I see here a friend, Adams, on, he's an expert on the end of days. So anyone has any questions, you can, you can turn to him. But um, what is the Yom Nechama? When is going to be that ultimate day of comfort? But the truth is, I think that this idea of the day of comfort and not knowing it is true for grief as well, for personal grief. When is there going to be a day where I don't feel this pain, where I don't feel the suffering? When will that switch be flipped? When, like, just like we move from life to death, will we move from a day of suffering to a day of comfort where I can wake up in the morning with unbounded joy, with feelings that there isn't suffering for myself or for my family or the, that matter for anybody. When is that going to take, when is that day going to come? And the Midrash here is saying that that's hidden from humanity. Part of being human is not knowing when that day of Nechama is going to be. So we live with it. Okay. Everything until now was an introduction. Don't worry. I will still have you home by nine o'clock. And lucky for you, you're already home. So if I go over, there's no commuting time. So I wanted to play a song. Um, the song is called Hafachta. Uh, it's originally by a diaspora yeshiva band and uh, then got repopularized again by Blue Fringe. You have turned my eulogy into a dance for me. You have undone my sackcloth. And bound me with joy. 
the mind is my mecha kavod lo Oh, let my heart sing out to you and not be silent. Adonai lo hayu lamodeka. Lord, my God, I give you thanks to you. And this is a pasuk for those who have the practice of davening each morning or even some mornings. You might be familiar with it. From the Mizmor Shir, Chanukah Tabayit David. It's the ending verses. And the psalmist is thanking God for turning eulogy into dance, from turning sadness into joy, from tearing off a sackcloth and rebinding with happiness. Hafachta, you switched it just like that? It's like you flipped a coin. You turned it over. First you were giving a eulogy, and then you were dancing. Is that possible? Is it possible that it's just two sides of the same coin? Just like life and death. There's death, and then the coin flips, and there's life. There's sadness, and the coin flips, and there's joy. There's eulogy, and there's dance. It's magic. Uh, when I think of dancing in the context of my mom, I have two memories jump out. Uh, the first is any time two specific Beatles songs came on in our house, I, mom would dance. The first was, she was just 17, and you know what I mean. I'll spare you the rest of the song. But uh, that would get her dancing. And the second uh Twist and shout, of course. Um, we'd all be dancing in the living room. And I also just have lots of special memories of um, <laughs> everyone on this call knows that I like to cry, so I'll be okay. Um, that. Um, I think like being at bar about mitzvahs or weddings or any smachot where my mom and dad would dance together. Just very happy memories. But the second story I wanted to share was um, last Thursday night, my uh, little brother and I were talking and we were, I think I was crying probably and um, we were talking about my mom. And then in the middle, uh, my aunt's cousin, Phil, texted us. And he said, hey, you want to come on to a Zoom dance party? And uh, I, was, I was in the middle of crying. But I was like, sure. And the truth is, it felt so natural to go from like a place of eulogy and mourning and sadness to a place of dancing. It really did feel like a flipped switch the same way from a dark room to a light room, you're in the same room, just now the lights are on. It was the same emotions being channeled in a different way from being, from crying to dancing. Um, you may recall that this pasuk of, well, I don't know if you recall this, but hafakht mesbidi, we say it uh, each day. It's also the special tefillah that we say at the end of davening on Hanukkah. Although ironically enough, the Midrash identifies this psalm with the story of Megillah and Esther, uh, primarily because of this pasuk of hafachta, of you switched, you turned over, which may remind you of the pasuk in um, Megillah and Esther of v'nahafochu, or in uh, pasuk chafbet, Particularly, Kaimim Asher Nachu Bahem Ayudim Ayobehem Bachodesh Ar Nehepach Lahem Miagol Nesimcha Ume Evel Yom Tov La Sototam Yeme Mishter Vesimcha Mishloach Manot Ishlere Hu Matanot Avionim. Then a hafochu, it can be switched. At one point, it seems like it seems like there's going to be destruction. It's grim. Then a hafochu, on a dime, the narrative changes. The Jewish people are saved. And they're okay. And so 
it seems like the first way to read this, these psukim, this song, is that it's a magic trick. It's a miracle that God gets to perform. It's a miracle about the way the world works. Uh, sometimes someone texts you and invites you to a dance party. Sometimes it's the Jewish people being saved but from the evil King Achashverosh. Sometimes it's the Maccabees triumphing over the Mithyavnim and the Yivanim. It's a flip, hafachta. You turned it over. Um, the next piece I wanted to share, the next interpretation of this is from Rav Cook. And I wanted to give a short word of introduction to what he's going to share, because Rav Cook enters into a theological place that I find terrifying. And this is the theological place of trying to explain suffering, or at least giving a justification or an explanation for suffering. And in general, I run away as far as I can from things of this nature. I don't want anyone to tell me what my suffering means or what it's good for or how it helps me. That's not a helpful theological framework for me at all, especially if it's someone else telling me. Um, and while I believe that's true, and I also don't recommend if somebody if there's somebody in your life who's giving you those explanations, shut them down. It's not worth it. Um, although sometimes it works. So one time uh, there was we are very lucky to have a garden outside our home that is tended to and cared for um, and grown beautifully by Mayan. And um, one time there was somebody here helping with the garden and uh, she started cutting down like huge sections of this bush, just like totally cutting. And I look like haphazard to me. And um, this was like maybe like a few years, two or three years ago. And it was just terrifying, like just chopping down like this huge bush. I was like, are you, you, she's just killing the bush. And she was like, no, if you like pull, take off these like vines, like the bush needs more room to grow. It needs more room to grow. And in this moment, I had this like awful thought because there was like this theological explanation for suffering felt resonant for me. And that was, I was, I did, I was like a lot of dissonance there, but um, it was this moment of like, oh, Sometimes people get cut down or die in order so that other people can grow. And if any like, rabbi or person would have told me this, I would have been like, you need to leave my house right now. <laughs> um, but like, it wasn't an intellectual thing or explanation that I read somewhere. It was just a feeling I had in the moment of how much I've grown since my mom has died. And also all the ways I haven't grown or the ways I've regressed, but the ways in which I've changed or developed as a result of her death. And um, the frightening part is, well, that that makes God the gardener. So like, I hope God is seeing something beautiful here, but I don't know. So like, that's, that's where I get to with um, this kind of theological framework. Uh, so, but I want to show you, and that works for me, like sometimes. And I think this is true for all of um, everything I'm going to share tonight and any conversation about suffering. It's like sometimes the ideas resonate and sometimes they don't. And some years it works and some years it doesn't. And that's a thing that can keep changing. And I always am reminding myself of that. So this gardening metaphor was like beautiful on that day when I saw it. And then a week later, I was like, that's awful. But today, today works again. So when I want to read you Rav Cook's explanation. So this is from his commentary on, the, on this uh, Tehillim. Um, and here's what he wrote, wrote writes. Oh, sorry. And it's a little bit um, esoteric and intense and flowery, so we'll work through it together. And I'll probably just close it at some point and explain it, how I understand it. So, uh, The sorrow that is found in this world is only there to bring about the recognition of fullness and gain. And just like the deficit and absence are expressed as eulogy in the Pasuk, so too fullness and satisfaction are expressed as dance that awaken the soul from an abundant inner rejoicing to celebrate in movement highlights the familiar joy of the feeling of goodness. And thus, 
והתימו יפה במעמק החיים, הפך את המסתובבים האחורי. And thus the lack itself comes to fulfill the fullness and to beautifully tinge it in the profundity of life. And so here, Rav Kook offers this explanation that the giving of eulogy, the feeling of deficit, of lack, the existence of absence in one's life, of missing, creates space, creates a recognition of what one has, gratefulness for the time spent, for the memories that are there, for the people who are still alive, who are still a part of one's life. You turned my eulogy, this eulogy which felt holy about suffering itself, becomes a container, becomes a space for joy to exist as well. And he continues. It's a little smaller and longer. That's, yeah, I know. Just as the missing through external absence, scarcity and deficit can be a condition that surround one's status as happy, that is expressed the eulogy, so too the inner missing that holds back the rejoicing light of the soul is unable to come out and raise up the light from penetrating and appearing in the distant places that are able to receive its appearance. This is Zothi Chagirat Hasak, Hotem Ate Keha, Misgeret Ivul Agabe Chaim, Vot Seret at Shutfam Hatsohel. So he says that the sackcloth that one wears, Hafacht Misbedil Macholi, Pitachta Saki, you have opened my sackcloth. This sackcloth is like, it's the darkness, it's the opacity, it's the heavy, even though sackcloth is kind of light, light. I, when I think of the word sackcloth, I imagine like, burlap sacks that you wear in a potato race in a festival. I don't know if that's everyone's, that, that's the universal image, but like there's, it's not tight. It's not binding. It's not like, it's not snug. You can kind of move around, but it's enclosing. And it, um, I guess it hurts. It doesn't help when you're tied to someone else's foot also. But um, in general, like you, you can't, you can move in it, but you can't move very far. The, insides, the inner joy, the desire to be happy, to live life freely, to be open to the world, you're just closed off by this formless sack of sadness uh, that surrounds oneself. So in the Pasuk, he says that part of the turning of the hesped into mechol is Removing this sackcloth, pitach tasaki, you've opened up the sackcloth, and now the joy that's there is able to express itself again. It's able to shine its light again. Um, and in this way, Rav Cook is offering that um, living in that sackcloth, being in that sackcloth, gives a greater appreciation for when one can move about again. Um, creates a different kind of recognition. And through the recognition of the way one is constricted, constricted by the sackcloth can ultimately take it off and can ultimately uh, be rebound up with joy. Um, but if we come back to the Pasuk, thinking about it, not necessarily in Rav Cook's explanation, um, but it's sort of the thinking about the sackcloth, it's this creation of space. Uh, it's creation of a container. Uh, when we were talking about this, when I was talking about this with Mayan, a few days ago, she gave the um, the sense that if at some point in my life uh, I had unbounded joy in this world, like being under an open sky, uh, so the sackcloth is a frame now. There's a, a container, there's a way in which that boundless joy is limited, where that lightness that I once felt um, is now bound up. It's now contained. And therefore, joy still needs to bubble through that. It still needs to pass, you know, go out, move outside the composition into an open composition painting, but that framing is always going to be there. Um,
And uh, when I think about this idea of space and absence that it, it enhances one's life or creates a different kind of depth, uh, moves me to a Torah that I've shared um, often over the last few years with mourners um, about the pasuk of Hamakom Yenachem Etchem B'toch Sha'ar Avelitzion Yerushalayim. And uh, part of this Torah was developed uh, in conversation with uh, Yoav Schaefer, um, who experienced some of his own deeply personal losses. And um, here's the Torah. May the space, may the place comfort you amongst all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. This is a line that in Ashkenazi communities is recited to, to the mourners um, when they're sitting Shiva. And uh, I usually think there's three ways of explaining this, and there's probably more, but there's three ways that I like. The place, the place should comfort you. This room that you're sitting in, likely it's a house that you lived in or spent time with the, your loved one who is no longer there. You should remember the times you sat there together. You should remember the um, all of the things that happened in this room or the things that are currently happening in this room. There are people visiting to offer comfort. This place itself should be a comfort to you. The second is the idea of makom, as God as the omnipresent. God is everywhere. The Midrash says, hamakom, uh, baruch hu makom sha'olam, the lo ha'olam mikomo. God doesn't exist in this world. The world exists in God. Um, God is part of the place, surrounds the place, and God's presence should always be a comfort. Uh, but I think in Yoav, uh, when we had this conversation, gave an image of a photograph. And the photograph has a cutout for somebody who is no longer there. So imagine a picture of one's family or a picture that includes some people's parents or grandparents who maybe are no longer there. And instead of seeing them, there's a cutout. And um, that cutout is a recognition of the place that that person once was. So it's through the absence, through the space that's there, there's a sense of presence. Uh, so then Makom doesn't just become about a physical location or God's location, but it's actually through the missing, through the lack, through the, in Rev Cook's terms, through the deficit, through the eulogy, that's where presence is felt because you sort of have an outline of a person or a framing for where a person who is no longer here was once in. Um, and I find, this, I find this idea comforting that the creation of space, the giving of space, the recognition of all the places where a person is no longer in your life, all of the Friday phone calls I no longer make or receive with my mom, or the not going to um, see her in Philadelphia anymore, all of those places and absences is a place that I can feel her presence as well. And um, ultimately those memories should bring one or can bring one to joy, to dancing, to laughter, to machol, from a place of hesped to a place of dancing. I think also this is uh, the basis or connected to the idea about the halachot or minhagim of a shiva house. Um, there's, as many of you may know, there's a a rule or a law or a practice, I think it's good common sense that you shouldn't initiate conversation in a shiva house. You let the mourner uh, initiate the conversation. And but I think part of this is that it allows for the creation of space. It allows for the creation of absence, for the creation of emptiness, which can then be either seen as empty or be transformed, hafachta, can be turned into a place for memory and for, for comfort. Okay, so those are, um, that's one way of thinking about this pasuk, or two ways rather. There's the magic flipping of the switch is option A. And option B is that somehow the lacking, the missing, um, the container that's created by absence comes to be filled up. Uh, but as I was working on this, uh, talk this evening, I came to a, a third place. Um, and this third place is 
Whereas those first two are, the first two things I mentioned are comforting in certain moments. This third one is aspirational. It's a model that I would like to embody and um, feel because I think it's the one that's most realistic. If we start off talking about, you don't know the Yom Hamita, you don't know the day of death, and you don't know the Yom Nechama, and you don't know the day of comfort. So, so I think um, there it creates a sense of binary. There are times, there is a period after death where one is not comfort in a state of grief or sorrow, and then they can move to a place of nechama. Oh, once you hit that day of comfort, it's like you're in Disney World all the time. You've transformed, you've moved over. We never, we, and we went to Disney World when I was two, right? Three? Dad, I'm looking for a nod, yeah. yeah. So I'm uh, two years old, yeah. Uh, you want to be like in Disney World all the time or some place of joy, you're some place of comfort and solace. And this is like, um, this is a, this sounds beautiful. It sounds wonderful that I could go from a place of pain and sorrow to a place of comfort. But I think the truth is that it doesn't really work that way. And I know there's people here on the call of all ages and who've experienced all kinds of losses and know that that's not the case. But I want to share some Torah on that. Um, there's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot uh, from Ben Bagbag, where he says, Hafuchba v'hafuchba, dekulaba. Ben Bagbag is teaching, of course, um, about the Torah itself. And he says, hafuchba, hafuchba, turn it over, turn, turn it over. It's all inside. If you keep reading more and more Torah, keep learning more and more Torah, take the lines, turn them over in your mind, you'll eventually get somewhere. You'll eventually find something deep because it's all there. The kulaba, it's all inside. But for me, what jumps out about this um, Mishnah, about hafuchba and hafuchba, is the doubling. Right, we, before we said, turn over my eulogy into dance, turn over my sadness into joy. And Ben Bagwag would say, and it's going to turn back, and turn it over again, it's going to turn back. It's not a binary. It is, I mean, it's two, but it's not just one way and then you cross over the timeline and you're in the other one. It's, it's revolution. It's like the coin has two sides. But it keeps on turning. It keeps on flipping. Um, turn it over and turn it over again. And um, I want to connect this to a, a pasuk that also comes back to gardening, although a different kind of mashal altogether. Um, and this is the pasuk of oh. Hazarim Bidima Birina Yiksoru. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. Debbie Friedman's got a great rendition of that. Those who sow. Who sow in tears will reap in joy, will reap in joy. And in some ways, this initially presents um, this same kind of flipping of the switch or the same kind of binary. You plant in sadness, you reap in joy. Some moments, there's moments of beginning that are difficult, but ultimately there are rewards or there's payoff or you harvest, and now you get to enjoy the fruits of, of one's labor, even if it was done done in pain. But in this new context of hafokhba vafokhba, the turning over and the turning over, what happens? You turn, you plant in sadness. I always think of um, hazarim bedima. You plant with tears, like the, the rain is the, are the tears. You plant in tears. Birina um, yiksoru. And then the next year, you have to plant in sadness and reap in joy again. And then the next year, you plant in sadness and reap in joy. I always think of this Pasuk of Hazarim Bidima Berina Yiksoru as a one time thing. But the truth is, it's a thing that happens every year. You plant, you make new beginnings. You have, we have, thank God, we've had two children since my mom was that. We've planted in sadness and we reap in joy. And it's something that happens over and over and over again. Every new beginning, I feel, for us has been done in sadness. And yet there's still fruits of that labor. There's still the harvest, the bringing in of the sheaves the carrying, the bearing of them, which is done with joy. And it happens uh, again and again. Um, and uh, when we think of this term, uh, what is it, right? Like a, 
Hazarim, uh, sorry, I'm mixing up all the Tehillim Sukim that Psalmist had a way with words. You turn my eulogy into a dance. So um, I spent a lot of time believing that Umachol was an instrument because it's sort of there. When Miriam leaves, um, leaves Mitzrayim, she has the Tupim Umim Cholot, right? They have their drums and their dances. Their drums and their, where they brought their dances with them. What does that even mean? How is that even possible? I always thought a mechol meant like some other kind of rhythm keeping instrument. Uh, but I wanted to share this um, beautiful midrash from the Michilta. Oh. From the Michilta Rabbi Shmuel. Et atof biada, Miriam has the drum in her hand. V'chiminayin hayu lahem l'Yisrael tupim mecholot b'midbar. How do they even have these drums and dances, these drums and dancing instruments? Um, the trusting righteous ones, that should say righteous ones, not righteous ones, uh, knew God was going to save them, and they prepared for them drums and dances. And I love this idea because it's one thing to like to, to bring a drum, that makes sense, I get that. But to like have prepared a dance feels feels like extra extra impressive to have like know what the movement is going to be. Um, and so I think this part of this idea is that the dance didn't necessarily need to be prepared. The dance is the natural. The dance comes when one gets a sense of the rhythm. And so ha-fokhba ha-fokhba hazarim bedima berina yiksoru hazarim bedima berina yiksoru ha-fokhba ha-fokhba ha-fakhta mispedi l'macholi it happens in a rhythm. And the dance, we know how to dance. Some would say that I don't know how to dance. Um, but dancing is, is something that is boundless. It moves outside the frameworks. It's when the joy or the feelings, whether it's sadness or happiness, come out and express themselves and dance. And it's done to rhythm. It's done to a hafakta and another hafakta and another hafakta. I just want to come back um, and wrap it up here. That's a pun on the word wrap it up. But um, I want to come back to the Pasuk. Hafachta mispedi lemacholi. Pitakta sa kivet hazreni simcha. Lemani zamercha kavod velo yidom. Adonai lo haile lamodeka. O let my heart sing to you and be not still. Velo yidom. Like the yidom of Aaron. After his sons are killed. The silence. But also, don't don't let it be silent for too long. Let the rhythm kick in. When uh, when there's a drum, when there's a tof, when there's a machol, there's the beat, and then there's the rest. The beat, and the rest. But don't let it rest for too long. Let the beat come back. Let the dancing come back. You have turned my eulogy to a dance for me. You have opened my sackcloth. And you have bound me with simcha, with uh, joy, with happiness. And um, simcha was also my mom's Hebrew name. Bidachta zaki, please, Hashem, please open my sackcloth. Please let me feel bound up with mom, with simcha, with joy. I'm going to play the song again and try not to cry, but I really invite you all to dance in your seats or to stand up and dance. Please.
screen reader so I can see everybody. Fifteen minutes early. It's amazing. Um, that's all I have to say. Um, folks could unmute themselves if they want, but I'm really just so, so deeply grateful for everyone for being here to like to have a hug. <laughs> and um, and to the community for um, creating a space and a feeling that this kind of Torah or these kinds of feelings are ones which I have not only permission to share, but um, appreciation for and desire for. And that's like a very, that's a very special and unique thing to have in this world to be a part of a world and a community that gives a sense of home. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Love you, man. Thank you. I don't even know who said that. That was awesome. That was like a boss call. Uh, I usually end Zooms by sending people to breakout rooms. But I'm not going to do that for you. Because no. no. <laughs> I don't want to make you talk to each other unless you want to. Uh, specific people who want to be in a breakout room with specific other people, they can uh, they yeah. can send me a chat. But um, but uh, folks can leave when they want to go, and I'll press end in, uh, in five or six minutes. It was very lovely, Shortov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Moshe. Your mother will come to you. Don't worry. Don't worry. Thanks, John. Uh, all right, should, should leave? People leaving. All right. Bye. All right. Love you, Rabbi Ezra. Thank you for for sharing your Torah with us, for bringing us closer to you and to your mom. May I show my have an Aliyah, and thank you for sharing. Thank and you. I cry easily too. It's good. <laughs> thank you. We love you, Ezra. We miss you, buddy. Thanks, Dave. Hey, Shosh. Hey, Dave. It's good to see you guys. You too. Guys, we are like all of America here. Got like, uh... <laughs> uh, Ezra, this is Iris in Florence. Your, your mother's neshama should have an aliyah. And this was a beautiful tribute to her. Very beautiful. Thank Thank you. Thanks. Ready to hang out with you all night. <laughs> Thanks, James. We could play, could play more music, you know, dance party. Yes, yes. Ezra, there was a request to show your mom's picture again. Uh, I'm happy to put that on the screen again, sure. I feel bad that it feels like very um, narcissistic that I'm in the picture too. It's just the one that I have on my phone. <laughs> I would have just shown a picture of Duster, but I don't have a picture of Duster on my phone. I have them like in life. That's before your hair was trimmed back. Yeah. Amina just said that's Ronan. It is Ronan, it's true. Is he, you can recognize him? I thought she was saying your mother looks like one. No. Oh, well. no, I she's holding her own end. 
Hi, Sam. Sam, I can't hear you. You're at, you're muted. There you go. It's good to see you. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. I was very touched by your beautiful thoughts and the depth with which you express them. And uh, I want to thank you for letting me know a little better. I'm very grateful to you for listening to me. Thank you. I love you lots. Pacha mis vidi le ma choli le ma choli shemel kale olam ho perfect time to exit by the way. Dad, you got to unmute so we can hear you. No, we can't play together, so you're going to means you're going to have to carry it. <laughs> He's Love you, Ezra. That was Thank beautiful. You, Love you, Ezra. Good to see you. All right, I'm going to press end. I'm going to press end. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you all for being here. Love you, Ezra. Love you, Ezra. Good night. Good night. Shove Love watch you. Out. So good to hear from you, Ezra. Love you. Hey, Diva. Good night. Good to see you, lady. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Good night, my best friend. Good night, Ted. Good night, Bev. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. So wonderful. Love you, Ezra. Good night, everyone. Good night, Arnie. Love you too.